This is the bonus section podcast, episode number 40. Is servant leadership really an effective strategy? Are you the type of person that knows you were meant for something greater in this lifetime? And that somewhere inside of you, there's just this bigger version of yourself trying to break through. But in spite of all your self-development attempts, you just can't seem to find the way up. Well, then, hey, you are definitely in the right place. I'm Danny Griffin, the founder of The Bonus Section and the host of this podcast. And a person just like you trying to live the most fulfilling life possible. Now, to help you take immediate action to get started in the right direction or moving in a better direction, we take the notes from each podcast and we post them for a brief period of time over at free thinkingtools.com. So if you feel like sitting down and thinking through the notes and listening to an episode and help you really think through to a better way, I'm happy to help. Okay. So it'll be sitting there, freethinkingtools.com. All right, let's get after this subject here. Is servant leadership really an effective strategy? Let's talk about this because the servant, you have this concept of this humble person and don't they just get steamrolled by all these other obnoxious, pushy people that lead? Well, let's start off. The first point is the carrot or the stick. So we see all sorts of examples of uh, leaders, coaches, motivating people with the carrot, aka the reward. So you think of the rabbit chasing the carrot um, or any sort of animal that likes carrots for that matter. But I think of the rabbit trying to chase that carrot. It's always out there and the reward is there, right? It's that that sense of positive reward. The dog sits, you give him the reward. Um, the, 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 the other point is, what about the stick? You know, you see um, these malevolent animal trainers slapping the animal with the stick and they still get an effective outcome. So it seems to be an effective strategy or the coach who's yelling and screaming at the kids and still wins the, the tournament, the, you know, the gymnastics meet, whatever it is, you see it everywhere. You see the stick. And sometimes it's harsh and people scratch their heads, but yet a lot of people will follow and they'll pay that money to that coach or that leader who uses the stick. And sometimes they get caught up in the emotion of some big national movement, international movement. So they both definitely are out there and they're very real. But the question on the table is the carrot. Does it lose? What's the scoreboard look like? When you think back in time, recent time, long history, Who are the leaders that really win? And of course, those that use the stick and were malevolent and violent, they stand out because they scare us and and there there are a lot of it. But then you have the the great leaders that they certainly, a lot of them stand out, but maybe the scoreboard looks a little bit warped. Maybe our perception is the stick wins and it's more effective and we we get disheartened. But but I'm going to lean in on this, this carrot. I've been a long time real estate coach and uh, the father of five. And I talk about both of those things a lot because that's my life. Those things are my life, my ability to serve. And I have a very core concept, and especially the bonus section being derived from that concept that I want to live as a person for others. It's really, really important to me. So I always start with whenever I can, and certainly far from perfect in this, but it's a good anchor to bring me back to ask myself the second point here. Am I working on the fulfillment of others first. Now, again, this podcast is a fulfillment of that desire, but I try to do it everywhere and I try to check myself because it's very easy to want what I want, to get what I want because it feels good to get the thing. Like a child, I want that toy. My mother used to always joke that there was a place called Child World, which was loaded with toys. And I used to, you know, I was just a little kid, Child World, Child World, Child World, right? So we want what we want to feel fulfilled. But as time goes on, we understand that that instant gratification or getting that toy, I had more toys in the basement that I probably used once and then not again. So we know that over time, as we evolve as better thinkers, that there's not a lot of fulfillment in that for us. So then we try these other things. We pursue uh, whatever, a, a, a sport, a, um, a passion. We go to school. We get a job. We start a company. We do these things to fulfill so that we can look in the mirror and feel achievement. It's, it's very, very empowering to feel that you have achieved. But even then, a lot of really successful people still feel unfulfilled. How can that be? How can you achieve all of this? And, you know, you, you get to the pinnacle of sports and you, you win the, the, the greatest trophy that there is, or you sell your company or you, you ascend to the, the highest level of the job, but yet something's missing. 
And I believe it's because you really still lack that fulfillment for others first. Did you really serve? There's something amazingly powerful about truly being a person for others, that true servant mentality and really helping other people fulfill their lives. And we celebrate some great historical figures who have done this. And perhaps you live around somebody that you know. There are a lot of teachers like that, a lot of coaches like that, that really are just these wonderful, fabulous people who have transcended a lot of personal fulfillment. Now, you don't see them feeling fulfilled because they served you, they taught you, they empowered you, they lifted you up. But I'm going to make an argument that the richest people in the world, in life, in history, have started by helping others feel fulfilled first. Now, the third point comes back to the other side of the coin. Yes, I get that, but doesn't it seem like it take forever? It takes forever, and you know, a lot of those people they don't get wealthy, and they don't seem successful, and nobody notices them, and there's that insecure side of us. So, doesn't bullying my way work faster than their way? Doesn't muscling my way there? Let me give you an example, right? So, in business, um. In, in, in the real estate business, you can make an outbound call and you can pick up the phone and, and, and a lot of the telemarketing training that's out there teaches people neuro-linguistic programming, which is a crafty way to understand the way that the brain really thinks and to, to say something to somebody, have them repeat it back or you repeat their words. And there are a lot of technique there. I'm not going to get into it because I'm not anywhere close to an expert on it, uh, but it feels manipulative if it's done malevolently to simply get what you want. Now, if you le learn techniques like that and you l use them to serve, if you're trying to cut through somebody's anxiety and, and you're getting there, wonderful. Techniques are, are, are great. But there's just too much bullying in business, in sports that's going on. And people will, the way that they'll justify it, they say, but we won. But we got paid. But we got bought out. Okay, Great. And, and maybe it did or didn't work faster, but you have to really do case studies of both sides of this coin to answer this question, does bullying really work faster? And more importantly, what kind of a long lasting echo effect does it have? You can bully somebody into selling their house when they're scared, right? You can. I mean, I've been in houses where people are just so frantic and so worried that you could take advantage of them in a second, you know, have them lower to some ridiculous price or come in and offer them a cash deal and buy it yourself and then flip it out. And, you know, I've seen that live in real estate my entire career. I, I've seen it uh, in sports. As an athlete, I've seen people use performance enhancing drugs to win. I've been a runner. I've seen it done there. Um, you've seen it, you know, I mean, Lance Armstrong and everybody that was in cycling, you saw it there. That's sort of bullying your way through. And that's what it is, that you're, you're doing things that, you know, are just muscular. And then they have you begin to compromise that you're really not, you're not a person for others. You're not trying to compete on a fair level playing field, but yet you're the, I don't know what it was, the six time Tour de France winner. So it worked faster, it worked better, and, 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 and he achieved. So he bullied his way to the top. But look what happened, the disgrace that comes from it. Once it gets revealed that that's how you got there, there's just something about all of us collectively. We just really can never really feel good about the bully or the one that rushed and, and, and bull rushed everybody else at their own expense. Sometimes we still hold them up on a pedestal. But it, but it really is the, the other way. It's the other way that, you know, you think of, I mean, really in, in modern times per se, in the United States, you have Martin Luther King, you have stories of Mother Teresa, you, you have Gandhi, you, you have these peaceful protesters, these peaceful resistors, those people that go up against these bullies and they lean in for the betterment of others. You know, that's really what it's about. Think about it. It talked about fulfillment of others first. And then you have these benevolent people who really were willing to lay their lives down for other people in the face of the bullies who have taken over, who have manipulated and who are in power. And it did work faster and they were there. See what I'm saying? So we have this dilemma that a lot of bullies get their way right to the top. And quite frankly, because maybe we're scared, we back them. And there's been some ugly historical examples of where we fell for the bully 
and I say collectively as humans, humans fell for the bully and they, they wanted to be part of the winning team at all, com, uh, all costs and they compromised all ethics. Any ethical behavior that they had, they just threw it out the door. I'm not going to get into the ugly examples historically, but it's not that long ago. Some really ugly historical figures um, led their way through bullying to, to what seemed to be national success for certain countries. And, and it was ugly, but it was fast. It was lightning fast, right? But the echo effect of that is just so ugly and it lasts forever. It's hard to root out, you know, when you do things that way. All right, so let's get to something that's a positive practical application of being a benevolent person for others in a servant mentality. And let's talk about how it does work well. So again, I'll give you my personal a coaching experience. And quite frankly, when I'm um, sitting here today doing this episode, I just talked about this practical application in real estate where I said, serve, qualify, close. But I'm going to relate it to sports too, because I have um, a son who's in, in a hockey environment where I see what good coaching looks like. And I see serving and I see qualifying. And I see the ability to close together and, and do these certain things, right? But in business, when you're making an outbound call, the idea is, are you cognizant of that person's context? Why are you interrupting them? Do they have context that you can serve them? Can you offer them information that with or without you qualifying them and then closing them? Could you genuinely, in that first beat, serve, hoping for nothing in return? Could you do that? Could you really use, like, to, could you give away your carrots without asking them to run your race? Could you really do that? It's super, super powerful. And the coolest thing about that methodology of serving first is that no matter whether or not you close the deal in the end, you leave this massively positive footprint for your business that not only makes you feel good, but it leaves a positive echo effect of brand. And I'm telling you, it comes back to you in some other way, even if you weren't able to, to, to qualify. But that's the next point. If I serve you, if I meet you in a context and I can give you information and then insight and I can give it away for free, what I'll get in return for that gift rather than bullying, there's no gift back in bullying. Bullying, you got to bully somebody the whole way through a process. You have to muscle them. Bully is a pretty strong word. So let me use muscle. You have to muscle somebody through if you're really grabbing them by the nose and leading them that way. Whereas if you serve, there's something else that changes. There's a law of reciprocity that opens up, the gift-giving principle. And it allows you to further qualify if there's an opportunity, not bull rush, not muscle, but to ask, hey, it seems like you're about to try to do this thing. And I'm, I'm saying it generically to any business person. It seems like you're trying to do this thing. Okay. Could I ask you why? See, now you have not only served by giving, you've opened up them to a point where maybe now they like you a little bit and they trust you well enough to tell you their why, why they're thinking about selling or buying a house, why they're thinking about buying insurance, why they're thinking about getting a mortgage, why they're thinking about buying a car. And it applies to coaching too. If I can serve a young person who's trying to become a great gymnast, who's trying to become a great actress, who's trying to become a great hockey player, a great student. If I can serve them first, then I can qualify and say, well, why? what are you trying to do with this sport, with this class, with this direction? And I qualify. And then if there's an opportunity for me to do business, to be their leader, then I close and say, well, you know what? That happens to be what I'm good at. Let me tell you a little bit about my services or how we could take this to the next level. But see, all the while when I served, no matter what happened, I left a good footprint with that person. I was a genuinely good life mentor for that small moment in time. And then I was able to qualify them and point them in a direction that's other than my, if I can't close them for me. See how this works? That's freaking powerful. I mean, really powerful. And so that every day that when you put your head on the pillow, you know that, hey, maybe I didn't close the, the, the deal, but I served. And once I qualified, they really weren't a good fit for me, but I was able to reference them to somebody or refer them to somebody else or point them in a better direction. I left them better off than I found them. Pretty cool, right? 
So servant leadership can be really effective. Not only really effective, it can be really positive and echo effect, right? That that even if it stays in your lane and you got more of what you want, money, business, clients, whatever, you won, sure. But even when you don't, the servant mentality leaves this massive positive air about you, your business, your efforts, whatever it might be. Let me go back and summarize these points. The question on the table today, is servant leadership really an effective strategy for whatever it is you're applying it to? Well, let's go through this. You have to start off by first considering all examples of the carrot where you are being a servant and you're leading somebody with positive information, positive feedback, positive outcome like a carrot, or you're whipping them from behind with a stick to get them to move. So it's the difference between getting up underneath somebody, empowering them, versus getting up above them and dragging them by the nostrils. The next point was... If you simply go to the carrot side of the ledger, start with fulfillment for others first. Are you fulfilling that person's needs at that moment? Now, maybe you're not qualified, so you can point them another direction, but think, let me fulfill for this person first, because the benefit is you will get fulfilled by serving others. That's the whole point of this podcast. It's the birth. It's the cornerstone of this podcast. But... I know a lot of you start, but but bullying, it works faster, right? Doesn't it work faster than this? Well, maybe in the short term, maybe, but there are so many cracks underneath that foundation that when you bully somebody and you get that result, you know, people don't like to be bullied. They don't like to be muscled. And sooner or later, they lose faith in that kind of leadership. And they become fissures and then they become cracks and then chasms. And then it always seems to fall apart. When, when a business or, or, or a country or leadership, a party, when, when just bully, it just doesn't work that long. And I'm not going to get political here, but you, you can look at all sorts of very recent and, you know, generally recent and very historical examples of where bullying maybe got to work fast, but it eventually fell apart just as fast. So how do you make a practical application of the positive side of this ledger? Serve first serve. Whatever that means to you in the context, learn how to serve. Then once you've served and you, you, you really have truly given something of value, your time, your effort, your information, your insight, whatever, you can then qualify the situation of that person a little further. Why are they doing this? Why are they moving in that direction? And if you have a service that helps them get there where you can make money or you can get a formal client or a formal mentee or whatever it is, close. Say, yes, I have this. So yes, you can close um, or I have the, that's exactly what our party believes. So I think you should join our party, right? Politically, I think you should join our class. I think you should join our team. Close. Don't be afraid to close the situation once you've gone through this. And even if it's not closable, at least you can go back and say, well, I served and left them with a positive footprint of what to do with or without me. I qualified further so they had consciousness about, you know, how that could apply to them. It just wasn't a fit for me. Or it was. It works because I use it all the time. All right. Let me talk about this. Leadership is always a hot topic. The world in its evolution, or lack thereof, is affected very directly by those that gain the biggest following. Think about social media these days. Followers, followers. Now, although each current generation falls prey to the belief that their current day society is degrading faster than ever before, the reality is that there is always a fight and always has been a fight between the benevolent servant leader versus the malevolent selfish leader. So the simple question is, which one will you or are you following? Or better yet, which leader will you choose to be? All right, remember, you can take immediate action to get moving in a better direction because we take all the notes from these episodes and we post them for a brief time at freethinkingtools.com. Also, don't forget, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen so that you don't miss out on any insights each time we upload. We also post them all over social media. So if you look for the bonus section or you turn on the, um, the notifications, you will find us. We'd also appreciate if you would share our content with other people that might like this stuff and they might need this help. And then you can join us in the mission of becoming truly that servant leader 
based on being a person for others. Hey, thanks for listening, but I'm signing off the same way I always do. Nobody's coming for you. Nobody. So go get to work on a better plan for your life, and I'll see you in the next episode to help you do just that. Thanks for listening.